everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our Missouri Trailblazers program on John William Boone and Charles Shores. Brought to you today by the Missouri State Museum. My name is Pam Stone and I am the Senior Associate here at the Holt Summit Public Library, which is a branch of the Daniel Boone Regional Library. Joining me today is Lauren Williams, who is the Adult and Community Services Manager for the Daniel Boone Regional Library. Hi, Lauren. Hi, Pam. Hi, everyone. Today's program is the seventh installment of our Missouri Trailblazers series, featuring trailblazers who have impacted Missouri. I would like to say a special thank you to the Missouri State Museum for their partnership and organizing these presentations. Thank you very, very much. I now would like to turn things over to Angela Wells, who is the Education Specialist for the Missouri State Museum, located in Jefferson City, Missouri. Angela, would you like to say a few words about what's going on at the museum? Yeah, thank you, Pam. Um, so I just kind of wanted to discuss some of the different exhibits that we have on display right now at the Missouri State Museum. And the first, which goes along with our Trailblazers program is our Trailblazers exhibit. Um, we opened our Trailblazers exhibit in November of 2020. And the theme of Trailblazers came about from this year's Missouri State Bicentennial Anniversary. Um, this exhibit highlights some exceptional people that have helped make our state extraordinary by providing leadership, innovation, and creativity. The Trailblazers exhibit has displays that rotate every few months, so there's always new things to see, so please come and check it out. Um, another exhibit that we have is a fairly new exhibit called Memory and Claw, um, and this exhibit highlights military flags and banners. This exhibit rotates new examples every six months from the more than 400 flags and banners in the museum collection, some of which date back as far as the 1830s. Um, and then finally, another exhibit we currently have on display is titled Show Me Hooked Rugs, which showcases three dozen traditional hooked rugs by Missouri artists, past and present. The rugs will be on display through August at the Missouri State Museum. All the rugs are hand hooked and reflect a facet of Missouri history and culture. Going along with this exhibit, we had rug hookers in the Capitol today um, demonstrating their, their skills and teaching people the, the basics of rug hooking. Unfortunately, that event did end at 1 p.m. today, um, but our exhibit is still on display and you can come and check that out through the rest of the month. So please do so if you have some time. Um, and then I just want to throw out a program that we have coming on September 1st for our Landing After Hours series, which is on the capitals of Missouri, um, put on by our museum interpreter, Henry Genske. Um, and so you can attend this program either in person or virtually. And if you're interested in attending in person, the program time is from 7 p.m. to 8 p.m., but the doors open at 6 p.m. And it'll be located at Jefferson Landing State Historic Site. 100 Jefferson Street in Jefferson City, Missouri. And if you want to attend this event virtually, you can go to our Missouri State Museum Facebook page and watch the event from there. All right, back to you, Pam. Thank you, Angela. I appreciate that. It sounds like you guys got a lot of great things going on. All right, well, Today's program is about John William Blind Boone and Charles Schultz. This afternoon, we welcome back Steve Anna Landwehr. For those of you that have had the opportunity to participate in her program for Hat Day in January, you know that you are in for a real treat. Steve Anna is from Jefferson City and is with the Missouri State Museum. She has taught at both grade school and college levels. She majored in history and political science, which is why she enjoys working at the museum. In her free time, she likes to train and take care of horses. She's also worked at the Reality House in Columbia as a substance abuse counselor and for the Diocese of Jefferson City. Thank you all for being here. And now I'll turn things over to Steve Anna. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I hope you enjoy this as much as I enjoyed preparing it. Um, one thing I would say is that uh, some of you, maybe all of you, know quite a bit about both uh, Blind Boone because of the location in Columbia of his um, house and all. And um, you might know quite a bit about uh, uh, Carl Schurz. And so um, knowing that, 
I want to say that if you'd like to make comments in addition to ask questions and provide some more information, I'd be really happy to hear that. So let's get on with the program. Welcome to this presentation on trailblazers. These two gentlemen are extremely interesting and extremely exciting as individuals and then for purposes of comparison as both being trailblazers. Trailblazers generally are people who open up new territories and these two did that in various ways. They are kind of interesting in the sense that they are familiar folks to the central Missouri area. Boone was born in a small town <clears throat> close to Booneville. However, he lived most of his life in Columbia. Schurz had been born in Germany. However, uh, he spent time in St. Louis. He spent time in Jefferson City. And so they are familiar to this area. So we're going to explore their lives, their ways as being blazers, and we're also going to look at the trails that they forged ahead. Uh, notice that uh, the caption there for Carl Schurz is that he was a good, good German, and in the process we'll probably find out why he was called a good, good German by an artist, by an author named uh, Connor, who will appear, whose name will appear at the end of the program. Boone was a ragtime pioneer. He was a music genius. And so his trail was quite a bit different, but we'll see how it was uh, the same in a lot of ways. And in the process, I hope that uh, you will find this as interesting to see and explore as I did when I prepared some of the material for the program. I um, also hope that you will be able to see how uh, that good, good German characteristic follows and how a uh, ragtime pioneer follows for uh, John William Boone. This is the way their life started out. This is a part of their life as being uh, blazers. They were very, very different. And if you look here, you can see some contrast. Carl Schurz uh, was born in 1829 and uh, died in 1906. Uh, Boone, however, was born in 1864, which is quite a bit later. And then he died quite a bit later in 1927. I had mentioned that Schurz was born in Germany. He uh, came to the United States in 1852, whereas Boone was born here in Missouri, in Miami, Missouri, which is a small little settlement, which was a small little settlement outside of uh, Booneville. Schurz came to the United States in 1852. On the other hand, Boone's mother was a former slave. Her name was Rachel Boone and uh, she was a descendant of uh, one of Daniel Boone's daughters, Rachel. So that's how he has the name of Boone. His father is a little bit less, less known than is suspected that he was a bugler in the Union Army because his mother uh, worked uh, at, at, as a cook for the Union Army in, at that camp there at Miami, Missouri. So his mother was a former slave. So this is the contrast between uh, their lives. But what does the trail look like for both of them? Both of them were spirit-filled. They were energetic, they were engrossing, they, were, they had intense interests, and they were very, very intense about what they did. They were realistic, they celebrated concrete reality. They were not afraid of the, the uh, hard things like grief and separation. They struggled. Both of them were oppressed. Schur was being oppressed by the German, actually by the elite oligarchs that were ruling in Germany at the time he was living there. And they were also, and Boone was also oppressed to an extent by the white oppression that occurred uh, after the Civil War. There was a lot of participatory activity on their part by the way that they invited all people, all walks of life, to join in various kinds of situations that they were involved with themselves. 
but they were also very consoling and sustaining and exploring with people, honoring their individuality and uh, inviting them to see new things, but recognizing their own uh, individual lives and backgrounds. Participatory and life-giving are pretty much the same, so I kind of have them together there on the slide. They were both challenging. They were willing to try new ideas, ways, music, encouraging others to do the same. So we'll look at their way that they challenged other people. In terms of being spirit-filled, I want to go into this just a little bit more. Schurz had a very good education. He was born uh, in Libnar, Germany, but he was educated at the University of Germany, uh, at the University of Bonn in Germany. However, he joined during that time a force of rebels against the German aristocracy during the revolution of 1848. He was a brilliant fighter, but he was also captured, but he escaped. He had a teacher with whom he was friends, also in the rebellion. His name was Gottfried Kingle. He was captured and in prison. Schurz had skipped out of the country, but he went back in and helped his friend to escape down a castle wall, and both of them escaped together. He planned the whole venture, including the bribery of guards, endangering his own life, and then both of them ended up in Scotland. Thus, he established his reputation at the age of 22 as a very daring revolutionary, spirit-filled, and energetic. But Schurz could not return to Germany, so he traveled about and came to the United States in uh, 1852. In the meantime, he studied, gauged situations before the Civil War, saw it as a chance to support freedom for slaves, and he learned English. He also obtained a law degree, and he became very proficient in English. Boone, however, at a, as a child of 10 months, had an illness which they called a brain fever. His eyes were mo removed to relieve pressure, and so he was blind from infancy. However, early on, he showed extreme musical talent. As a child, he had a band of children who played in the streets in Warrensburg, where he lived with his mother. She was a house servant at that time. He played himself a tin cup and a whistle. However, he watched people play the piano, and sometimes he would sneak in and try it himself, and he could play without any instruction, spontaneously. He even traveled to towns along the railroads and made his fare by tips. He was supported by the community, and they sent him to St. Louis School for the Blind. But that didn't work out very well, although he studied. But he would just leave and go to the Tenderloin District in St. Louis, where black people went to play uh, ragtime. Eventually, he played there too, but he was finally let go from school because of his absences. From there, life was tough, and he was captured by exploiters who paid him for entertaining, but also did not really pay him and deprived him of food and clothing. Finally, his step stepfather rescued him from one of these exploiters in Palmyra, Missouri, and took him home. From there, he received some musical education, particularly in classical piano, from some of the best instructors in the country at the time, uh, locally in Missouri and in Iowa, and he very much enjoyed this and prospered. He proved himself to be spiritual, energetic, and daring, not afraid of people at all, nor was he afraid of discrimination or blindness. Notice in the quote, he said, the quote, the quote says, in one of his last uh, interviews, Boone said, there are many definitions of music. I like to define music as the sentiment of the soul pressed in, to in tones. So this shows how spiritual he was, um, as well as being very uh, practical and very spiritual. But both of them were realistic. So how were they uh, realistic? I had said that Schurz came to the United States, and he came in 1852. He had married Margaretha Meyer, and he lived the first, time, the first of his stay in the United States in Wisconsin. He knew about slavery and oppression from his days in Germany, and so he joined the Republican Party, for which he delivered speeches in both German and English. He earned his citizenship papers. He was elected to the Republican National Committee and worked to win support for Abraham Lincoln among many German Americans. He was realistic in seeing and admitting the injustice and suffering of slavery and realized how hard it would be to end it. When the Civil War started, he rallied American, German Americans to join in the effort and raised regiments in New York. He was given an officer's commission and joined the Union Army in 1862. 
he was in command of a division of Franz Siegel's corps in the Virginia mountains. Franz Siegel also was a German immigrant who was from Missouri. He served in the, some significant battles, Schurz did, in the battles of Second Bull Run, Chancellorsville, Gettysburg, and Lookout Mountain. He left the army with the rank of Major General. He was realistic in his willingness to accept the consequences of his values or freedom, especially the abolition of slavery. So he was willing to put his whole life on the line in order to be realistic about his uh, destruction of, his hopeful destruction of uh, slavery in the United States. William Boone, Blind Boone, endured racial discrimination. That was a way in which he was uh, realistic. He grew up in a time of segregation. In his personal life, he was confronted with much opposition. Sometimes, but, but it was strange opposition. Sometimes it was as though in certain areas, discrimination did not exist. During his early youth, he accompanied his mother to work and they worked in houses of white people. He was accepted there in those situations. He learned and moved in white society freely, especially when he went to the school for the blind. When he traveled on trains, he observed seating, but he moved through the train as a performer. And usually he could not and would not stay in white only hotels, staying instead in black, with black private citizens in the community. Later on, as a concert pianist, he played for integrated audiences, if possible. If not, he would play two con concerts in one town, one evening, for instance, one for whites and one for blacks. But he always played the same types of songs for each audience. As a per performer, he was equally sought by both audiences in, publics, in the public, in churches, and organizations. During his later teenage years, he was educated by white instructors and schooled in classical music. He was extraordinary insofar as he, equal, he was equally talented in classical compositions and also in the Negro plantation songs. While he was uh, presented with classical music and composers in school, he familiar himself with the plantation songs or the coon songs, which, which was what they called them at that time. Thus, he not only played them, but he composed them. And they were very expressive, and he was very expressive of their styles, their life, their lyrics, their moods, and their tones. He was realistic in his appreciation and respect for them. And you can see this in some of the uh, readings uh, of uh, the tunes, such as Georgia Mellon and That Morning in the Sky. His respect and appreciation for their art generated the same appreciation in his audiences. People, both audiences, were very appreciative of both music and longed to hear his renditions. Not only did he compose the current kinds of, um, of uh, plantation songs, but he also uh, varied those and, and responded with new versions of them. It is important to remember that he could not read because he was blind. And so all the music that he produced, either uh, for um, the concerts or for the production of a piece of music on paper, he depended on somebody else to write that down. And he was then, um, the author, but he would play it and they would have to write it down. But he could never really read sheet music at all. Everything that he learned had to be by his instinct and by his, uh, by his own uh, memory and by his ears, by his own ears. Let's look at how they were participatory. Carl Schurz, after the war, uh, moved to St. Louis in 1867. Uh, he um, became active working with political leaders, including the United States President, uh, Andrew Johnson. As such, he was uh, called to, a, to attention to the experience of former slaves, and he opposed demand for the harshest treatment for former Southern uh, Confederate leaders. He was an abolitionist, but he did not advocate revenge. He used his influence in the Republican Party at their convention in 1868 to include amnesty for those who had served in the Confederacy. So what is being looked at here is that he tried to present the sides of both 
the former Confederates and also for the uh, former slaves and to be looking realistically at uh, their conditions. He owned a German newspaper and he was elected to the Senate, which is uh, a portion of which you see there on the slide. He was elected to the Senate from Missouri in 1867. Boone, on the other hand, Blind Boone, on the other hand, brought people together on a concert stage. He opened the door to uh, all uh, music. Uh, he was very life-giving. He was energetic. He played long hours of concerts, and he traveled great distances, enduring all sorts of problems with grace and ease. He was also a great contributor to churches and schools and civic groups by contributing money to them. But best of all was his humor, which he showed daily in life as well as in his concerts. He always started his performances with a hymn and then moved to the classical works and then on to the plantation songs. Some of these, as I have said, have never been written down. Uh, some he uh, wrote from simply having heard them and someone else he told someone else how to write them. One musicologist described these as rare concerts Rare, sorry, rare jewels of authentic Negro folk music. Between 1880 and 1913, he had given 7,200 concerts. He had traveled 144 miles. He had given $180,000 to charity. And by 1915, he had worn out 16 pianos. His presence and success encouraged racial acceptance by whites and served as a role model for blacks. So he was very much uh, a, a part of encouraging, he didn't actually say it, of course, the way Schurz would have said it, but he was encouraging mutual understanding by a mutual understanding of music. So it is extremely important, for instance, that quotation, um, to see uh, how he uh, did that kind of thing around the country. And this is very, very, very well documented in terms of the numbers of concerts that he gave and in terms of the way he encouraged participation among many uh, people. He was life-giving. He was life-giving. Both of them were life-giving. Uh, Carl Schurz um, opposed demands for harsh treatment of the South after the war. He urged understanding of both the leaders. He was an abolitionist, but he didn't advocate revenge, and he greatly influenced the Republican Party to include amnesty. The slide shows a, a, the beginning copy of a thing called the Report on the Condition of the South. He was asked by President Johnson to tour the South and come back with a report on the conditions of the South. And the report that he gave was very significant because he called attention to the many problems uh, that uh, the freed slaves were experiencing. He called attention to some of the perceptions and attitudes of people, uh, not only uh, leaders, but also some of the regular people, uh, white people in the South. And he tried to say that there were problems that needed to be addressed. And he continued to address those problems whenever he could, wherever he could, even if at times he was really not uh, particularly uh, listed as, uh, or, or mentioned as doing so. John William Blind Boone was very energetic also, and I had mentioned that he played long hours. Uh, he contributed to churches, as I said, but he maintained his humor. I have said that once before, and I really want to maintain that again. Traveling great distances, and he was a role model. The um, photo in the top right-hand corner there shows the chicory piano, one of the chicory pianos that he had. It said that he wore out pianos, but some of them remain. And this was one of the main ones that he had shortly before he died. And it is still maintained, and I give credit for the use of this photo uh, at the Boone County Historical Society. So uh, very, very life-giving in terms of his uh, presentation of music that then would promote understanding among various kinds of people because they all enjoyed all the music from whatever perspective, whether it was classic or if it was plantation music. He was a pioneer of uh, the ragtime music. 
and I want to say a few things about ragtime. Uh, ragtime was a very interesting kind of thing that was a combination of classical music and the plant uh, music that was developed among the black people. And I can't reiterate enough that he saw all the importance of the artistic ability that surrounds both of these two types of music. Ragtime was his forte, however, and he learned about it when he was a youth in St. Louis. However, when it came to uh, ragtime, it's not often understood, but it is a way in which um, a beat is either added to the chords in a, music, in a piece of music or it is absent. A beat is absent. So where you would expect to hear a beat, it might not be present. Whereas if you expected to hear it, it might be reiterated. So he had a very distinct way of developing that style. I want to say a few more things about uh, their um, uh, challenging dimension. Uh, Schur's uh, campaign for Rutherford B. Rutherford B. Hayes as a Republican candidate because he was pro promised to use the civil service in the federal bureaucracy, but, but Hayes appointed him as Secretary of the Interior. At that time, the department was very corrupt, inefficient, and mismanaged. Schur's uh, also saw that within the Department of the Interior, there was much bribery among Indian agents mistreating the Indians, and there was also theft of mineral rights on governmental land. He announced immediately when he assumed that position that there would be no clerks in the department removed except for cause, and promotions would be only given for merit. He was imaginative and challenging and of the existing conditions. In the Bureau of Indian Affairs, he fired Indian agents who took supplies intended for Indians on reservations, and he fought with the War Department, which allowed the complete slaughter of Buffalo and insisted that uh, the United States policy should be to protect the natural resources, not only of the buffalo, but also of the federal lands, because they were being uh, destroyed by the forest uh, industry that was stripping the lumber from federal lands. Boone, on the other hand, uh, was very, very challenging, and he took a lot of risks with his music, but people loved it. He composed a piece called the Marshfield Tornado, which tells the story in his music of a tornado which actually struck Marshfield, Missouri during his lifetime. Uh, he was, it was widely popular and he played it all the time and it sounded like a real tornado. People, people came just simply to listen to that particular piece. And I think it is extremely important, I'm going to reiterate again, that he took uh, the old American music history that goes back to the time of slavery it's, itself. And it comes from the rhythmic, rhythmic style that moves European music for, and the heritage of black spirituals and the camp meetings and the plantation music into the um, uh, classical music. This place, it was an improvisation and it was risky and much of it was never written down but some of it still is, and some people still play it on that piano that I had shown you from the uh, Boone County Historical Society. This kind of is um, the background, so I would be open to uh, your willingness to look at some of the sources that I have used very briefly. Uh, there was a very spectacular, magnificent speech that he made, which was called A Plea for the Indians, the, Spirit the speeches, speeches of Carl Schurz and it was published in 1881. Uh, he is well documented in some of the Missouri history, as you can see there, and the person who called him a good, good German was Richard O'Connor in the book, The German Americans. Uh, Schurz was extraordinary in that not only was he a challenger and also was a uh, politician, but he also was a very outstanding, upstanding man who was never really accused of any kinds of scandals or uh, there were no block, blotches on his uh, life. Um, Schurz has had two 
uh, very significant biographers. One is Jack Batterson, and the other is uh, Mary uh, Barley. Um, they both contain many good stories that illustrate uh, the uh, life of uh, Blind Boone and why he is such an important uh, person. And I would encourage you to uh, seek out those books. They're not that expensive. Uh, there's also some um, uh, good biography of his life uh, located in the State Historical Society website. The National Park Service, well, I'll back up a little bit. Boone uh, passed away in Warrensburg, but he was buried in Columbia. And his house, the house where he lived a, a lot of his life, is maintained as an historic place. So by way of conclusion for the presentation, just want to reiterate that uh, Boone's house in Columbia on Flat Branch is available for the public to go through and see. You can also see the piano at the Boone County Historical Society. So this will conclude the presentation part of the program. And we'll uh, see if you have questions. I have a few more remarks which I can make when we get together and talk about this. So uh, we will uh, go to that with your questions or observations. I'd be very happy if you have additional comments, additional information you would like to add to what I have said, and we'll just go from there. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much, Savannah. That was wonderful. Um, I do have a few questions for you. Uh, the first question I have is, how did you come to put these two individuals together? Well, I think the first thing to say is that I had looked at probably five or six, maybe seven, people who were listed as trailblazers and somehow or another, I just at random selected some. And um, I happened upon those two among the others that I looked at. And when I looked at both of them, I first of all saw that they were very, very uh, interested in people other than themselves. They were very open to other people. Um, that's how I was first uh, attracted and saw the idea of their similarity. I could see that they followed similar trails and that they were both, uh, and this is the second thing I noticed, they were both very, very energetic. Uh, they both uh, endured uh, very uh, significant oppressive conditions under different kinds of circumstances. But both, both of them kind of waved their way through. And those um, were the first things that attracted me to them. However, as I looked further, I saw that the paths, the trails that they forged were uh, pretty much the same in certain of the anchors, which I tried to locate. I mean, I kind of came up with this uh, as um, some kind of like anchors or maybe trees along the way that pointed the way. Um, they had different uh, goals that they worked toward one was in politics, one was in music, but the end result was always moving in a direction toward freedom. And um, as I look at these two trailblazers, I see freedom as the main thing that they had in mind behind most everything that they did. So that's how I came to be interested in that. That help? Yes, it did. Um, I have another question for you. What is the single most exciting thing about each individual? Um, it's really oddly enough, uh, joy, um, humor. Um, they experienced all sorts of hurdles, all sorts of troubles all along the way. But the thing that excited me, and I'm sorry to have to say, not about each individual, but about both of them, was that they always maintained a sense of joy 
in a sense of um, fun, if, if that's a good word to say, uh, because they went about their very serious tasks, but they always had fun. And um, by fun, I mean a deep joy that they received as they went about their business. So that's kind of a roundabout way, babe, but I think it kind of says what I kind of have in my guts about them. Okay, another question. Um, what is the single most interesting thing about each individual? The most interesting thing about uh, Shores, Shores uh, would be that he was, he was uh, sort of kind of like almost, as far as I can tell, above reproach. I mean, he was a politician, yes. He was involved in a lot of scrapes. Uh, he did um, a lot of innovative, different things. Some of what, I mean, most of what he did was pretty risky, but he always did those things. He, um, he took uh, risks and he always moved in the direction. So that's the most interesting thing about um, shirts. Uh, Boone, on the other hand, I found to be most interesting because he was a role model for many, many different kinds of people. And uh, I kind of said in the narrative there that he was a role model for uh, both Blacks and Whites, Native Americans, as we say, and African Americans, as we say today. Um, but he, by his music, he showed how people can uh, enjoy each other. Maybe that's the way to put it. So that, um, so that this was a very interesting. Uh, maybe that's almost like his signature ability too, but to me that was the most interesting, not the thing that particularly attracted me at, at first, but the thing that uh, I saw to be most interesting as I moved on down the road with this research. Okay. Um, I had a Attendee asked, how did Rachel Boone's descendants become a slave? How did Rachel Boone's descendants become a slave? I don't have a good answer for that. Um, the documents show that she was a slave and how it happened that she was both a slave and a descendant of Rachel Boone, I'm not sure except that somewhere along the line, somebody uh, was a slave there. Um, she uh, escaped slavery herself by working for the Union Army. Um, but the documents that I have been in contact with really don't say anything about where that happened to come about. Uh, what is interesting, and I said this in the narrative there, uh, his father's uh, origin is, is up to question. It varies a little bit from person to, from uh, researcher to researcher, but uh, there seems to be some general idea that uh, his father was a bugle boy, a young bugle boy in the Union Army there in the camp. And um, when he, he, when he, he, and he was born in the Union uh, camp there in Miami. And uh, one of the persons that he talked with after the war was over and when he became famous, had been a Union soldier there at the time he was born. And uh, that person uh, went in a different direction of describing things in the sense that he described how happy everybody was to see this child. He did not go into where the child came from or anything like that, but he was a Union soldier who was there. And um, that part of it is known now. It could be that some research will be developed about that, or maybe there is some that I'm not aware of, but a very interesting question, and we might keep that in mind for the future. Okay. Lauren, do you have anything you want to ask Steve Anna? Um, not not um, at this moment. I did want to point out someone in the chat. We have someone here, an attendee, who has written a book on, um, on SURS. I don't know if you've seen that in the chat that that uh, um, and he's saying that Schurz was also a gifted concert pianist 
And um, this person is also working on a book about Schurz and the New York New York's artistic and political, political scene. There are a few letters to his girlfriend after his wife died that he's found and translated. So we have someone who's on the in the Zoom program who has done a lot of research on Schurz. I'm, I'm really happy to hear that because a lot has been written about Schurz, but none exactly from that perspective that I'm aware of. But the more that we can know about this individual, the better off we'll be. And uh, I'm really glad to hear uh, that that research is going on. So whoever that is, I really thank you greatly for, for your contribution. And uh, somehow or another, keep us in mind and so that I can find that book um, when it comes out. Um, the two that I mentioned um, are very interesting, but there are other things written. But I, oh, I'm really happy to hear about that research. So great, great. Okay, that is fabulous. Yeah, uh, sorry, go ahead. Peter has actually raised his hand. Peter Lubrick is his name. I'm going to um, allow him to. Uh, Unmute, Peter, if you want to ask a question or provide some comments. Well, the book came out in 2019. And um, be happy to send the copy out there. I've been working on it for quite a while. And um, what the family suppressed so much of the knowledge that uh, we have about shirts until these letters and newspapers became evident after his wife died, he had a girlfriend, Fanny Chapman, <clears throat> to whom he wrote 1,700 letters, of which only 94 around, in old German script. Uh, his best friend in New York was William Steinway, and he had a Graham Steinway piano, that's the long story, heavily involved in music, and he was a good enough pianist to play at Carnegie Hall, another one of his friends, when uh, a performer did not show up. So he played Chopin at Carnegie Hall, all of his fight against anti-Semitism and racism had been suppressed by the family in his later works. So, and also he bore the brunt of being accused of running at Chancellorsville for many years, he fought it. They said all the Germans were cowardly. And that's one of the reasons he left the army. By the way, a uh, little note is he um, played piano so Lincoln could sleep. They were very, very close friends. And he was also close friends with Rutherford Hayes. And my stance is that we've erased him from our history only because of World War I and II. He knew every president out there. And he helped establish the national parks, which has been erased. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt got the credit for that. And he actually is the only uh, government official to visit the Indian reservations. So there's a Shirts in Nevada and a Mount Shirts in Yellowstone. And if you'd like me to send a copy of the book, just tell me where. That's excellent. Thank you so much. So because of his German heritage, um, um, you think that, that that's part of what led to the suppression? Yeah, what happened was he, um, after World War I, everything German was bad. Uh, people changed their name from Schmidt to Smith. We changed Frankfurters to hot dogs. Um, hamburgers became meat patties and so sauerkraut, victory cabbage. And because of that denigration and the following of World War II, uh, any German American contribution have wished that a lot. And that's what I've been doing has been erased. Uh, Siegel quit the army because of anti-German feeling. And Schertz was not, I would have just kind of tweaked that, was not a gifted military man. Uh, he never fought in the revolution of 1848 uh, 1849, uh, escaped capture by running through a sewer drain, and some of his colleagues were all executed and rushed out later, and then he broke Kinkle out of jail there, met his wife in London, and uh, where the first kindergarten was established, so, but I'd be happy like to, to send you a I'd like to respond to that. Um, I uh, uh, understand and relate to everything that you said. Uh, if I did not know that, um, I can understand it. And I can relate to it. So again, I'm grateful for your contributions here. I will just point out that I did not see documentation uh, of the uh, gifts that he had in music. Um, that doesn't surprise me at all, but it just points out another similarity between these two folks that I didn't recognize. So I'm grateful for that. Thank you. Here's the question. Did they know each other? I, I didn't see any documentation of that at all. 
any place. Well, the, the musical documentation just happened uh, with newspapers online and so forth. But I wouldn't be surprised if they hadn't bumped heads because, not bumped heads, but met each other because his wife, Schertz's wife, refused to go to St. Louis when he was, when he was there. She hated it. She went back to Germany to her wealthy family in Hamburg. But anything musical and anybody you could possibly name, uh, he had contact. He actually in New York had dinner with Paderewski, uh, Richard Wagner, all of the, the composers that came through, the symphonies, the Metropolitan Opera, and the family just decided this wasn't important and threw everything away. So I'm kind of retracking it. Uh, the first biographer, Hans der Fuss, uh, who since passed away, did not have access on the internet to the newspapers that we have today. So that's where, but I'm so happy and glad that you did a presentation on Carl Schurz, who has only been quoted by saying, uh, my country right, right or wrong, if right, keep it right, if wrong, make it right. And so I'm kind of on a German American theme, but only because of my own background too, and also some of the denigration we do feel today. But thank you for doing it. Thanks for being here. Susanna, is there anything else that you would like uh, folks to know today? Was there, did I miss something? Yeah, is there anything else you would like oh, oh, folks to know today? Um, not really. Um, not really. Um, I am, I, I would be interested in, um, any, uh, additional, uh, documentation, any additional information that can be provided because I'll kind of try to keep up with, uh, uh, what is being written about these folks, uh, as well as the other things that I have researched. So, um, I'm happy to add on and never can tell what more dimensions of this I can discover and help to provide to interested people. So that's about all I have. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you, Peter, for your contribution as well. Lauren has put that in the link of where they can find your, uh, your book. Uh, Steve Anna, we wanna thank you for joining us and sharing your time and expertise with us. I wanna invite everyone to visit the Missouri State Museum website. Also, we want to encourage everyone to join us again in October, actually October 26th. We will have a link on our website here to join the event there. It's Tuesday, October 26th, seven to 8.30. It is about ghost writers and spiritualist authors in the early 20th century and around St. Louis. It started out with a couple sisters in the mid 19th century when the spiritual movement was taking America by storm. And as it began to fade, this movement actually manifested in St. Louis and Lucas Schwartz with the Missouri State Museum is going to be discussing that and talking about two Missouri authors who proclaim to have used the Ouija board to contact spirits in order to pin posthumous novels. So that ought to be very interesting. I realize I'm having some camera difficulties, but we want to thank everyone for joining us for these programs. Please look for us in the future. Please go out and visit your museum and please enjoy the rest of your day.